There is a movie being released for at-home demand on October 13 that you must watch. It is called The Lost Weekend. Already many of you know the subject matter. The Lost Weekend, a love story. It's a documentary. It is all about my guest, May Pang. May, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your time. Congratulations on the movie. I was enthralled. I was enthralled with it. I really was. I loved it. Oh, good. I know we saw each other, what, six months ago, roughly? That was. We saw one another. We saw one another at a, an exhibition of yours where you were displaying photographs that you had taken of John Lennon. I bought one. I love it. I have it. And this is the story of The Lost Weekend, your relationship with John Lennon. Here's what I most wanted to tell you about the movie up front I know that you loved John. I know you love John Lennon. Everybody knows you love John Lennon. I now really appreciate how much he loved you and the window into his love of you. I've been eager to tell you this is Julian. Like I can tell by the way that Julian regards you, the way he perceives your relationship in a very good way, having been with his father. What do you make of that? Um, You know, I, I am, as I get older and I look back and I look at the relationship and we were making the movie, I started to see that. I was only when I was, you know, at the time, it was always, you know, at the moment, everything you do is at the moment. You want things to work. You wanted John and Julian to get together. I wanted uh, Cynthia and John to actually have closure. So, things I was doing, I did everything at the moment. It's only now when I look back when everything is put together that I see the the things that everyone is saying, what they see, which I didn't see at that time. What I didn't appreciate about The Lost Weekend and, and made, well, so many things that I, I learned from watching the movie, but I didn't realize how it all begins for you. You grew up in New York City. You had a, a bit of a rough situation with your dad. You were hooked on rock and roll. You show up at Apple and ask for a job and not the apple that the kids are thinking of today right (laughs) right it's the it's the record company uh alan klein got the the he was at uh the management for it and they had just gotten there the whole thing and i said oh my god there's it's here i just went up there and asked for a job and And i got it and that then leads you that then leads you to john and yoko right They started all of a sudden, when everything started to get settled, all the artists started to come to New York. And it was exciting because all of a sudden you had Ringo, uh, Badfinger, um, George Harrison, and then it was John and Yoko. And I ended up working for them because they needed people to work with them on their... um, their film, the shorts that they were working on. And and initially, like, everything is cool between the three of you. You you come into the fold. She welcomes you into the fold. You go to the UK. What was what was the house? Tittenhurst? Is that what it was called? Oh, my God. What, what went on there, by the way? Pa- paint that picture for everybody. It looks like a gigantic white house. It's a Georgian house. He had had all the walls, because Georgian houses were small rooms. He had them removed. So they're all giant rooms as opposed to little rooms. And um, and it was just beautiful. I have never seen anything like it. He had 80 acres. I actually got lost in it. And at one point, as we were filming Imagine, the original uh, concept that they had, all these vignettes for Imagine, I'm standing by this lake they have. And uh, John says, what do you think? And I said, I-, I said, it's great. He goes, yeah. He goes, the lake is um, it looks good except for the rubber bottom. And I went, what? <laughs> he had it put in. So, <laughs> and and this, this, as you make reference to in, in, with me now, this is the Imagine era. I mean, like, this is the white piano, right? You're there for the white piano. I'm there for it. Yeah. In fact, that rug that, that he's, that, that's there, when John and I got our apartment in New York City, he said, we didn't really make use of that rug. Have it shipped over so we use our that rug in our city apartment in New York. Okay, so now so now back to the United States, they move into the Dakota. Not yet. Not yet. Into no, they moved I um at the St. Regis Hotel. Right, at the Regis. Oh my god, the footage of the Regis, the film footage in The Lost Weekend is amazing. The quality of it was extraordinary. 
Well, they were using, because um, filming, they were constantly filming the, um, the, uh, the filmers. You know, they were, they were doing it all the time. Steve Gebhardt, Bob Freeze, they had cameras every, all the time. There were 16 millimeters, I think. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't remember. It's either 16 or 35. They're running around. So quality back then was definitely on target for them. And, and May, how would you describe your role at this time before the relationship begins? Because war is over. That legend, like you're singing on that song, right? Like you're not the conventional yeah, assistant. The chorus. Yeah, uh, the chorus. Everybody got in there. It was it was fun. It was exciting. So for me, working was the thing. Yeah, I just wanted to work. I wasn't thinking about a relationship. I wasn't thinking about anything else. I just wanted to work because to me that was exciting. So I, yeah, I, working at the hotel, I never left. I mean, I didn't live far from from the place, but it was. I worked late into the night. I, I ended up with a room there. I said, and I was the fir- first person to wake up, make sure they had their breakfast, then make sure all the all the editors and the film editors were let in into their room. So I was, it was constant. And I, I, for three months straight, I never even went home. So it, it all takes a turn. Don't worry. We're not giving it all away for free. We want people to go and buy and rent and watch The Lost Weekend. But at a point when I think you're 22, I think you've worked for them for about two years, 21? 21. Okay. And, and now, now their relationship, Yoko and John is going through something and she says to you, well, what did she say to you? Okay, we move into the Dakota. You could sense there's something going on. In between, they had lived in the West Village, because people know that. So now they're living in this big, huge apartment, and the tension's really mounting. You can feel it all around the house. So one morning around, you know, just before uh, the work day starts, she sits down across from me. She goes, May, I've got to talk to you. And I'm thinking she's got another event she wants me to be a part of, another project she's thinking about. So I'm ready. So I'm looking at her and she goes, you know, John and I are not getting along. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. And I'm thinking, yes, everybody knows. And she said, he's going to start seeing other people. And I said, oh, okay. And then, you know, I'm not thinking anything more than that. And then she goes, oh, I think you should go out with him. And I just sort of looked at her and go, what? Not me. I'm not interested. She goes, oh, I know, but I think you'll be good for him. I said, no, not me. No, thanks. Okay, it, that's how it started. Okay, so it's been like the most analyzed uh, interaction ever, but I have to ask, what what do you think her objective was? Do, do you think she, she thought that you'd take better care of him, that maybe you weren't threatening in the long run? I mean, what could have been in her head? I think it was all of that. I mean, going back and looking back on it, that because I was very, um, you know, not a, not a aggressive. I wasn't interested in John. That was never the the point. I'd been there for three years with them, so I and she. What people don't realize also later on was that she really wanted to experiment somewhere else herself. Aha! Uh-huh. So yes, and so that's what happened. But she needed to make sure her her, her husband was you know out of the way. What was, uh, pardon me for this, but was it a, an immediate intimate thing between the two of you? You, no. you, you go, it was not. You, you had to no. be courted and, and, you know, it had to happen on its own timeline. Right. Because I said, I'm not interested. And so, and she was pushing, I was removing myself. I said, please, I'm not, I'm not interested. Don't do this. And, uh, it was only later on that all of a sudden John, John, at one point, because I had to ask him what happened, and when he found out what Yoko had done and said, oh, I fixed it for you so you can go out with her, he said, what, are you crazy? How do you know I like her? And she said, oh, I know. <laughs> and he wouldn't come out. He was up, He was in his, his room. I was in my office, and we didn't want to see each other. But as time went on, I, nothing happened. And then, you know, he was the one that pursued me at the end, and that was the only reason I turned around and, and gave it a look the relationship between the two of you a total of a total of what 18 months right roughly yeah. okay and may one of the by, by the way your recall first of all a couple of things you look great okay you look Thank great you. and it's not just because of the shade of your hair which by the way is my sort of trademark color for my broadcast um your level of recall 
amazed me when I met you and amazes me now. It's like these things were yesterday for you. Am I right that you're one of these people who just, I can't remember yesterday. You, you remember everything that happened when you were together with John Lennon. It, it was, I was, I was a straight, I was a straight person. I didn't drink. I didn't take drugs. Right. I just dealt with what was happening at the moment. That just went into my brain constantly. May, it was those those 18 months, the so-called Lost Weekend, which is the title of your, your movie. I know people think about the Beatles and the productivity of the Beatles, but for John Lennon, that 18 months was a critically important time period. Will you just remind folks some of the music that he was creating while you were together? Oh, we did um, Mind Games. We started with Mind Games. We did Bulls and Bridges. We did the Rock and Roll. Uh, we did... Uh, he jammed with Paul, which I'm so proud of that I got a chance to do that. He produced a little uh, song for, for uh, Mick Jagger from a jam. He gave a song away to, wrote a song and gave it to Keith Moon, to Ringo. We went out there and worked on that as well. He produced Harry Nielsen. Um, and then let's see, what else did we do? There's Elton John. Little, little things. Oh, Elton. Oh, that's right. I forgot about Elton John. And then we uh, we went to Cowboy and recorded on that. And we went on to his last big public appearance at Madison Square Garden. And David Bowie, fame. So we did a few things. Uh, yeah, just a, just a couple of things. Hey, there's a um, there's a vignette in the movie. There's a story you tell in the movie that blew me away. Um, you know, like everybody else, I, I wanted everybody to get along in terms of the Beatles and always wondered what was the drill with with Paul and with John at the end. And you just made reference to the fact that they did jam together. But the cab story, like uh, there was a will you will you tell that, please? OK, when um, we were we were friendly, obviously, with Paul and Linda and uh, John said, oh, let's go and have dinner with them. We called. They weren't in the uh, in the hotel, so we had to go to a meeting. So we got into the cab, and as we were coming up, uh, I think it was like 60th or 61st Street, going towards Fifth Avenue, we were at a stop because traffic, of course, in New York. And John happened to look at the taxi next to him, and it was he goes, "Oh my God!" I said, "Why?" Because Paul and Linda. I said, "Run down the window, quick!" So he rolled from the window and he's yelling, "Paul, Paul, help!" Finally, because his window uh, was up, he finally realizes it's John. He rolls down the window and he said, we try to get a hold of you. He goes, yeah, I'm on my way to see, you know, Lee and all this. That's his father-in-law. And we said, well, let's cut touch base for later for dinner. And the, the two of them just talking to each other with their heads sticking out. And then the cars started to move and we split at Fifth, at Fifth Avenue. Come on. I mean, talk, hey, <laughs> talk about a talk about a New York story. Lennon and McCartney conversing between two taxi cab windows. I mean, it's unbelievable. I, you couldn't plan it. It wouldn't have worked. It was just that moment. So you see a UFO at a time when you're both naked on a roof, I think on East 52nd Street. How am I doing? Correct. That's right. <laughs> I was trying to get ready for the pizza man. So I'm looking for Clay. He's standing outside on, he's standing outside on the balcony smoking his French cigarettes because that always stunk up the house and he knew I didn't like that. Right. So he's sitting there and he's going, he sees lights, but he's thinking, oh, it's from the billboard signs. And then he realizes, what billboard sign? I live in a residential area. So as he turns, he sees this thing hanging over his head, literally just very quiet, just moving slowly. So he yells out to me and I'm not paying attention because I'm looking for clothes to put on. And I go, yeah, yeah. And then he goes, and then he yells out again, but he now was anxious. It was like, now. And I dropped the clothes and I go running out. And I said, what are you? And I stopped mid-sentence and I'm staring at this thing above me. And he's going, he goes, you're seeing what I'm seeing. I said, oh my God. And I'm screaming, it's an effing UFO. I can't, <laughs> nobody is paying attention because it's August, it's Friday. Friday night, oh. it's, uh, you know, in, in the summertime on 52nd Street, nobody's around. I look over at the, the windows on, at the street, across the street, not one light is on. They're all away. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my God, I'm screaming. And we watched it for a good solid maybe 10 minutes or so, 10, 15. I watched it go down, and it was flying, and he's screaming. It's flying below rooftop. I said, I know. It's going sideways. It's raining. I could hear the street 
below, but not this thing above me. And I always said that if Reggie Jackson at that time could hit a home run, he would hit this thing. It was only two stories above our heads. As if, as if your ride wasn't magical enough at that moment, right? Can I tell you? Can I tell you something else that about the movie that I was so excited to see? My broadcast mentor is Larry Kane. And, oh my God! And the idea that I loved the fact, and you know the role that Larry played with the Beatles when he was twenty or like he was your age when he was on that plane for the first tour of America, and the I and Larry has told me so many times about John coming to Philadelphia and doing the weather. And like, here it is in your movie. It was just, and I called Larry and I said, I sp- I met May Pang and you got to see the movie. You're in it, blah, blah, blah. And he was ecstatic to hear it. Oh yeah. And you know, it was because of him. He told me later, he said, many years later, he said, you know that John thought his happiest moments of his life was spent with you. I said, no, I had no idea. I didn't even know he talked to you about that. So it was a quite a big surprise to me. Um, coming from Larry as well, you know, that he told that John would say it to somebody outside of our little circle. I I best not give away what eventually happens with regard to the relationship, because I I, I want to be respectful and I want people to uh, I want people to watch the movie. Although I'm going to give this quote away from May Pang, quote, I took the I took notes when I watched it never ended. It never ended. Right. Right. Correct. It never ended. Yeah, good for you. Good for you. Well, I mean, what a wonderful, wonderful story and, and relationship. And now to be able to watch it. You know, The Lost Weekend has taken on like a whole meaning. I use that as an expression in my life to refer to like just a, a particular chapter of life. Uh, and, and, and it all begins with your Lost Weekend. Oh, thank you. I mean, it's just, you know, it has taken on. It's a... Uh, it's, um, the Lost Weekend, people don't even know about the original because how it started was people kept asking John about, oh, you were drunk out in uh, in L.A. We kept hearing about it because, yeah, it was a Lost Weekend. The reference to the original movie of Ray <laughs> Milan in it. Sure. And now it's taking on something else because it's a love story. Yeah, no it is. It's a beautiful that. story. Yeah. It's a beautiful story. Well, I wish you I wish you good things with The Lost Weekend. It's it's a privilege to, to make your acquaintance again. And I, I hope I see you again. Absolutely. I'm still on tour. I'm still doing the, uh, you know, the as you should be. I'm heading out to L.A. As you should be. I, I bought I bought the photograph of, of that you took of John with his dog. And that well, it was actually friends dogs. But here's the thing that when you got the one that John that was his favorite photo. Nice. That is nice. OK, May Pang, it's called The Lost Weekend, a love story at home on demand, October 13. Thank you. Nice to see you, and thanks again. Thank you. Okay. See you again. Love the movie. Love the movie. I'll tell Larry we spoke. Okay, great. Love him. Love him.